We ask once more, we ask once more as we bring this class before you that you may anoint Sister Carol, that you may anoint her lips, anoint our ears to receive that which you have for us today. Open our understanding, Lord God, and our knowledge so that we may be able to receive and grow from these lessons. Thank you once again for each and every one of our brothers and sisters and all the requests that have been sent today, Lord God, that you may hear them, that you may address each one accordingly, Lord God, and that you may supply to each and every one their need. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Okay, our lesson today is once again about a person full of valor. Um, Jim's surprise is coming out of Peter, but uh, it is a very exciting, at least when I started my lesson, I came away from studying and reading the scripture encouraged, uh, challenged, and this I think is something that all of us want for the simple reason that we want to be uh, challenged when it comes in our spiritual lives. Uh, we ask ourselves, are we that away? Can we be that away? Can we speak like they do? Can we do like they do? And it is a challenge. God may never use us in the manner they were, but in somehow, some way, God can. So as we start in our lesson today, um, it, my introduction here in the book that I use, it starts off, it says silence is golden, is something that people say. But often silence is not golden because there are times when we have to speak up. And in the case of the gospel here that we're reading here about Peter and John, we're going to find out that if they had kept quiet, it would not have stirred the people as much if they had just done the miracle that took place. And in this case, silence was not necessary. It should not have been. And um, they did what God's spirit led them to do. And a blessing, great blessing came from it. We learned from this lesson, if you studied your lesson, you read it, or you just read over it, that there are many challenges that we have in our spiritual lives, but one of the things that is our responsibility is to stand for the gospel, the good news. Now, today, I was thinking of, about the fact before we even get into the lesson that many times people use a Sunday school class as a teacher, exhortation. Uh, a testimony to get what they want to drive home or what's bothering them or what they have on their mind. But what I read in the scripture is every time there was boldness for people to speak or to, uh, to do what they were supposed to do for the, the, God, the Lord was impressing them to do, it was to carry forth the gospel or to carry forth the announcing of Christ or of what was to come. We've seen that in the prophets as they prophesied for the people of Israel to turn their, their face back to, to Christ or to turn their face back to God. And yet um, that announcement was not anything to do with the prophet. It had to do with what God wanted them to tell the people. And today when we have an opportunity to speak, we shouldn't be speaking our own ideas, our own conclusions, our own thoughts, or our own gossip. We should be speaking about Christ, about salvation. And to me, that was encouraging because too many times, um, and, and I'm sure that all of you sitting right here have found yourself in that situation, subjects will come up and things will come up, even among family, even among saints, Really, our focus when we talk is we should be talking about how good and how great and what a wonderful God we serve. And that keeps us from getting into areas that are detrimental to our spiritual life. True. And all of you here are, are mature saints, and, and I specifically have warned some, don't discuss certain things with people for the simple reason it's not going to help you at all. It'll destroy you. And in this case, the boldness they had to preach was to preach Christ. And I think that this is so awesome, the, the, the challenge that they took. So now as we go into Acts 4, 6, and 7, we're going to take them 
a couple of verses at a time as we start reading here. And uh, Sister Lolly, what are we going to do when you have that baby in your arms? Are we going to have to have Brother Wilmer babysit and you read? Or what are we going to do? You mm -hmm. worked that out already? Sister Laura, please read for us. And Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? Okay, what is the scenario here? You can't just draw it up out of the air and start talking about a scripture unless you know what is going on here and what is happening in chapter three did anybody take the initiative to go back to chapter three and study about or i don't want to say say read to bring to your mind what chapter three was saying anybody mm -hmm. nobody when I, don't they were I, I don't see a hand but i didn't read it but i know what it said okay sister rhodes has her hand up Y'all hear you? Here's Sister Rodis. Turn on your speaker. Oh my goodness. Yes, I was singing. Peter and John went to pray and they met a lame man on the way <laughs> because that's what happened. All right. As soon as I started reading this, that song came into my mind. They were on their way to Sing the temple. For them. Sing it for them. We can do Peter something. Peter and John this went to pray. Goodbye. They met a lame man on the way. He held out his arms and he asked for alms. And this is what Peter did say. Micey, you help me here. Silver and gold have I not. And that which I have give I thee. In, in the name, name of, of Jesus Christ, Christ, Christ of Nazareth, of Nazareth rise up and walk. And walk. He, he went, went walking, walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay, that's exactly what happened in chapter three. That's a good good song to teach the children, but it also it is as she said, she read that scripture, and then that's what came to her mind. Um, that well, here Peter and John went to the temple. And there was a beggar. Now, a beggar that was lame, but we want to know, we want to take note about this beggar. There's something important about him. He was lame how long in his life? From birth. From, from birth. birth. From birth. So he was known all <coughs> over the town or the city. They knew who this lame man was. They knew how long he had been brought to the temple every day and laid there by his <coughs> And he was asking alms. Would you please tell me what the word alms means, Star? Turn on your mic, honey. So I guess that would mean um, like just money, basically, or things that things that could help them. Okay, um, Sister Valerie, what what else is it called? Usually offerings. Okay, it's offerings or gifts money, food, whatever is given to the person they're asking for alms. In the case of the scripture, it was always normally coins of some kind that they would drop into their, their lap or their hat or whatever. Um, we have a name for that here to, in the States. I forget what it is. You have to help me here. Panhandling. Panhandling. Thank you so much, Sister Grant. <laughs> <laughs> Our readers. She, uh, I mean, panhandling is not what they did. And uh, the thing was that when people were lame or maimed, if you go in the scripture, you're going to find out that the family is the one that took them and laid them in these places. Can you give me another case of another person that was laid at the, um, laid somewhere? Come on. In the, the pool. pool. In the pool of Bethesda. Ooh, Bethesda. Bethesda. Bethesda the, the pool of Bethesda. So when the waters were troubled, whoever got there first got healed. Okay. And yet, if, if it, there was no troubling of waters, people knew that they would be there and they would give them alms. Um, we find it also with the lepers uh, that were on the outside of the city. 
We find it also of the beggars. We find it in many any ways where um, alms was something that was normal to be asked for. So this man was not a stranger to the people of Israel in Jerusalem. They knew who he was. And he had been laying there to ask. Can you imagine what he must have thought when Peter said, I don't have any money to give you. But such as I have, give I to thee. What would you think, Brother Wilmer, if somebody said that to you and you needed help in something? Lolly, turn him on. What do I think if somebody said? I yeah, let's to... say you had a great need. You weren't asking alms, but you had a need. And, and you asked this person, please help me here. And, and they would tell you, well, I don't have that that you need, but I'll give you something else. What would you think? I mean, I don't know. I'll be, I mean, I'm in need. So I'll be, okay, what do you have? To... <laughs> what do you have <laughs> to give me? That, that's one point. Or, or another point could be is, I, I need money to be able to survive. So don't give me whatever else you're thinking about giving me. I don't need to play the food. I need more money to survive so I can help my family. That brings me here every day too. It's not just all about me. So when he said, such as I have given to you, the man didn't know what to expect because he was expecting some sort of alms. But the greatest, greatest thing that he faced and he, he found out when is when he said, such as I have given to you, and he prayed for him, and he arose a new man. I mean, my mind boggles at something of this nature. He had to have limbs, and he was maimed, he couldn't walk, but yet he rose up walking and shouting and went through the city to let everybody know what had happened, the miracle had happened. Okay, mm -hmm. this is after the day of Pentecost, and this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what effect? That's why I like my class so much. I have to make you think in the answers. What effect you placing you in that city would it have on you, Sister Flora? I haven't, you haven't talked in a long time. Um, I think it would have different like multiple effects on me um if especially if I wasn't a believer um is the question are you asking me the question as a believer or non-believer I'm asking you just me oh, okay um I think that it would it would make my faith be greater okay what about you, Sister Kayla? I'll try to get the everybody today to say something. Put your speaker on, Kayla. Sorry. Um, a tremendous, a profound effect. I think that it would be uh, one of the things I would feel all of a sudden is filled with hope. Um, that's the first thing that comes to me, the hope, finally. Like there's a ray of sunshine in, in, in the dark. Okay. Uh, what about you, Sister Aloma? How would you feel if you were one in the city and you saw this man come running and jumping and praising God for the divine work that had been done? How would you feel? Rejoice. Huh? Rejoiced. Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Okay. Um, Sister Rebecca? I would want to know more. I would want to seek more, go in and to know more. Okay. Can, can I interject here that people that were there that had seen the crucifixion and been on the day of Pentecost, uh, it's just care to use the word hope, but it reinforces what now I have seen and believed because now he's not dead. His miracles, his spirit, his what he preached is still alive through his disciples or through his people. The remember that Christ has spent three and a half years doing miracles and walking through uh, Judea. He had been going from town to town, and these miracles had been done. 
And now it's almost like, I'm not going to say that this is the only case because I was not there, but you can read in the scriptures. They're focusing in on the day of Pentecost, the death and resurrection, then the day of Pentecost, but you don't hear of things like this happening. So to a certain degree, the people are thinking, well, uh, are all the miracles gone? Uh, how are we going to know that the spirit is still here, that his spirit is still working? And for many, it became almost like cement for their faith and for their hope. He's still alive. He's still doing a work. But then it wasn't just the work, but, oh, I love Peter. I like people like that. It says what they think. What did Peter do? In chapter three, okay, anybody have their, I, I pulled mine up on the iPad, let me go back. Chapter three, verses, if you got your Bible there, 12. Okay. And Peter saw it and he answered unto the people, you men of Israel, why are you marveling at this? You've seen someone do it for three and a half years. Why look so earnestly on us as though our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? In other words, it's not about us. Okay, uh, verse 13, Sister Valerie, I know you're looking at your Bible. Continue to read there. Verse 13, the uh -huh. God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in his presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Verse 14. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. 15. And kill the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Okay, he's not talking to the believers. Who's he talking to? The witnesses. The witnesses. And who are the witnesses? Angels. The people, the city. And who else? Who else was present there, Amanda, Sister Amanda? Oh. Edgar, oh. what'd you say? The disciples. The what? The disciples. Mm -mm. No. Yes. Those that he crucified, those that said uh, the ones that accused him the that crucified. Pharisees, the Sadducees, exactly. the religious people. That's who That's he it. was talking to. That's it. Not to the ones that were believers. They were the witnesses of having seen everything, but they were more than just Christian witnesses there. And this is what I love about Peter. He took advantage of what had happened, not to focus in on that miracle. We can't focus in in our spiritual lives on, on just certain things. We have to focus in on the what Christ has done for us. Yes. This is what gives us a testimony. Yes. Actually, Sister Willie May, would you please tell me what Jesus has done for you? Pardon? Can you tell me what Jesus has done for you? He has saved me from my sins. Okay, that's what you have to focus in on. And this is exactly what Peter did. Quit focusing on the lame man jumping and leaping with joy. But the very fact that the one who is the prince of life, who was raised from the dead, he pointed back to Christ, what he had done. He's trying... In other words, there's a new covenant or a new uh, dispensation. Uh, if you don't understand some of these biblical words, please ask me. Uh, a dispensation means there is leaving the law now. We're coming into the New Testament where things are taken by faith through uh, Christ Jesus, through salvation. So here we have a new dispensation. These people are having to learn something new. And see something new. And they're having mostly to admit there's something going on here that we don't know nothing about. Because who gives these two disciples 
tell me a little bit about Peter and John. Give me a little bit on their background, um, Sister Grant. They were two of the first disciples that Christ um, chose. And so they were always with him and they experienced salvation. So it wasn't hard for them to share with others what they experienced. Okay. And as, a, as, as their background, I mean, uh, where do they come from? Galilee. And what else about them? Fish. Mm. Fish. Fish. Right now, uh, who, who's, who's saying it? They were fishermen, fishers of men, uh, fishers of uh, fish, fishermen, fishermen. <laughs> fishers of fish. They were fishermen, <laughs> not fish mm -hmm. fishermen, fishermen. They were not educated, no, right. And right away, uh -oh. the Pharisees and the Sadducees realized it because you keep reading your scripture, you're going to read it in there. They realized these were men that were not learned. So oh, how come they're talking wow. like this and speaking with this power, they this would, boldness, oh. and how dare them talk to us like that? Who do they think they are? Well, this is what Christ gives us. This is the lesson that it really in the end is trying to teach us here. Oh. To have boldness, we can have boldness through Christ Jesus to speak that that we have to speak. And they had the boldness to stand up to this group of religious people. And I asked myself, if I have to stand up in front of a group of religious people for what I believe, am I able to do it? And you say, um, well, if God gives me the grace, yes, if God gives me the grace. And do you not know that you don't have to plan your words to say that God will put words in your mind and your heart to speak at that moment? And you'll be as elegant, eloquent, and as educated as the one you're talking to. Because God puts these words in our mouths to be able to speak. So fear not, lad, to speak when the opportunity arises. When something happens good in your life and somebody makes a comment about it or says something, I say, it's because I serve a living God. I serve Jesus Christ. And he has allowed this to become part of my life or uh, the blessing to come to me or, or he has healed me or he has done these things for me. It gives us an opportunity. And what Peter and John saw was not the opportunity to glory in the fact that they had power through Christ or through the Father oh. to heal. But it was because of Christ Jesus death that they were able to be disciples. They didn't focus on the healing. They were focusing on Christ. This is extremely important in the society we live in today. Quit focusing on a denomination or a group of people or that. You focus on uh, the world. We are in a state, and I don't know if it's just me or what I'm seeing, but we're in a state that people need to know that there's a savior and that he can save them from their sins. And they need to know exactly what sin is. We're not dealing with people that, that 60, 75 years ago, we lived in a Christian nation. Do any of you consider this nation Christian? No. no. Not anymore. Not anymore. None of us do. And if any of you are talking to any uh, college graduates or people in their third, early 30s, you're going to find out by talking to them, a lot of them don't know who Jesus is or what he did. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they don't even know how to identify sin because they do what they feel like doing and then they think that's okay. But that they don't realize that what's something inside. So what should our, our desire be? To preach the gospel when we have the opportunity that Christ is the only, and that's the golden verse for today, in case you didn't read it. Yeah. Neither is there salvation in any other. Any other. <laughs> For there is none other under heaven given and among men whereby we must be saved. And that he said, which we're going to get to in Acts 12, uh, 4 and 12. But before we get there, let's keep going. Verse 8 and 9. Uh, Sister Carol. Sister Peter. 
Okay, what does it mean, Sister Lola? Sister Rakalita? I, I just wanted to say this because you're talking about how, what you were just saying. And it, it brought to my mind the other day I was at, at, um, at the gym and everybody there, the majority are from Israel. And this lady came up to me and she wanted to ask me, what is it that you believe? Because I, I've, of course, I've said that I'm a Christian and, and then she wanted. And I, that made me feel good because there's got to be something that she sees different that, and then most of them are related to rabbis and all that. And they're always talking about when they went to the synagogue and all that. And she came up to me and said, what is it really that you believe? And, I, and that gave me, and I thank God, it gave me the opportunity to talk to her. And we you have know? to be, and we have to be ready for those moments. Okay, yeah. Sister Laura, read, read the verse 89, please. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Verse 10, three. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Okay. Was Paul and uh, was Peter and John intimidated by who was standing in front of them? No. 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 Okay. So they, they, were, they thought when they told them to keep quiet and when they didn't want them to speak of Christ that they were going to do it. But they were not intimidated. If we know in whom we have believed and we truly truly believe it and we have an experience we're not going to be intimidated by people it hasn't gotten to that point where we have to stand so stalwartly towards people but when like sister ruckley to give the example people ask us we're not to be embarrassed that that went went away a long time ago when you were young when you were embarrassed to answer certain questions but now you're mature Christians, and you should not be embarrassed to say, I'm a Christian. I have been washed in the blood of Christ Jesus. You take a stand for it. You believe it. You practice it. You live it. It's not something to be, to be intimidated or feel bad or embarrassed about because there's nothing to be embarrassed about Christ. Okay? So respectfully, he addressed the questions and the leaders uh, but he first noted that with our uh, irony, he mentioned, oh, uh, well, we, we healed a whole, we healed a whole man, an infinite man. Does that mean, and, and by what means he's made whole? And, and, and you're asking me all these questions now, all this stuff, is it bothering you because we have healed somebody? In other words, obviously it did because they couldn't do those miracles. They didn't have the power. So it had to been like a uh, like a, a slap in the face for someone to have the power and not be educated, not be a scribe, not be a, a Pharisee, not be a Sadducee, not be in the, the council, not be anybody. And they had the power to do that. Uh, to me, that's so amazing how just two common men didn't have all this other stuff but they had Christ and they had the power. Mm -hmm. And that was what they were striving to relate to these people, Every, everybody there. You killed him, you thought you got rid of the power, you thought you got rid of Christ, you thought you got rid of the 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 one, the Messiah that had been sent. Well, you're wrong. Amen. We're giving you a demonstration right now of what, that he's still here, that he left behind something that you know not of. And many of them died and never knew anything of it. Uh, he didn't mince words. He started speaking then now in verse 11. What did he say? This is the stone which was set and not of you, others, which has become the head of the corner. Okay. There was no stopping him now. Oh, no. He was quoting. Whom was he quoting here? He was there. 
Jesus. Yeah, he said it in Matthew. And who else was he quoting? Luke. Okay, okay. and Luke it is. But also he was a quote because Christ quoted Psalms. Psalms 118 and 22. Their own scripture where Peter, Peter identified Jesus as the stone that the builders, Israel's leaders, seated before him had rejected. And he was putting the scripture right back in their face. Okay, verse 12. This is the good one. I, this is the one we wanted to really cover. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none of my name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Okay, we want to stop right here. I know that everybody sitting here, if I was asking you to raise your hand, say, yes, I believe that. But what are we facing today that people are trying to use as their salvation? instead of the scripture. So today, I mean, the way I see it, if I may ask, uh, answer that question, um, not just a, what you would call evangelical religions that people are looking as a way of salvation, but people are looking more towards what the Bible calls the abominations of the earth because they're looking to other sources that that are not even related to the to the gospel or to the bible that you can use as a point of reference so more of that zen stuff more of the uh you know oriental religions more of those way out things out there um that you see people that they are migrating to that and they're they're really you know, focusing on those things because, you know, back in the day, maybe some years ago, you know, there was, uh, it, it was more prominent that you're dealing with religious people, just like they were dealing here, people who professed, people that, that you know, once saved, over saved, always saved. But it looks like today we are facing not just that, but we're facing we're, also we're these facing abominations that the, that that the, the Bible calls. Okay. That's my okay. that's my thing. That's my that's opinion. My... Yeah, I, there's an echo here. I'm trying to get rid of it. I think I know what's coming from. Okay. Uh they, they you said they're choosing other religions. Yes. Okay. Can someone tell me? Raise your hand. Don't want to all spout it out once. Give me a religion in which people are turning to today that we are going to have to be able to stand against. Christine. Uh, new age religions that are related to yoga and where they believe in power within themselves and power that doesn't come from God. Okay. Uh, for you, those of you that um, uh, Christine has joined us, as she's my niece. But uh, Christine, uh, if I may share, she came out of the Catholicism, but not only that, but she was into yoga and the Eastern religions. And when we were with them um, this past couple of weeks ago, and we were talking to her, my husband asked her plainly, um, what made you stop from going deeper? Okay, Christine, would you tell them what, what you answered? I said basically that I stopped because it was affecting my spirituality and not knowing the difference between what I was raised as a Catholic and believing that there was a God and believing that there was like a deity, other deities. Other deities. Okay. So if this, this puts a greater burden, I have thought about what she said and I bring this up this evening because we as a class we have covered these scriptures many times and understand them but and and i think of star going now back to college and live on campus the world outside our four walls where we live is pushing yoga okay and one of the things that she mentioned was the other deities it's not just yoga, it's not just one deity, it's other deities, other thoughts, 
of religion and ideas. It's being pushed. I think that God's people, we need to be ready to stand up for what we believe when we face it. We just can't say, oh, oh, they say, oh, but I'm religious too. I I practice yoga and I believe in the, the myself, as she said, that I'm a God myself. Then how do we counteract that? How do we respond? How do we be able to witness? And this is what, as, as my class, we need to think about. I call myself a mature saint of God. How am I going to respond? How am I going to help him? Well, the first thing we always keep in mind is that we want God to use us, number one. Number two is we pray for God to give us the words to be able to answer in the conversations that we'll be able to sound like we know what we're talking about and not just him hawing around. She never would have. This is the key thing is the spirit of God needs and should go with us just like it did with Peter and John, they stood with boldness because they had the spirit of God that we are so full of God's spirit that we'll be able to not just combat with words, but our very presence. Because I firmly believe, I don't know about you, but I believe that God's spirit can deal. Mm -hmm. I believe that he can stir a conscience. I believe that he can stir a mind that is in full of darkness. I believe that. That's what, what the spirit of God can do. So it doesn't matter who we face, with what kind of religion we, they are. We, we need to know for sure. Do you know for sure that there is no other name under heaven and earth? Have you proved it? Have you tried it? It's not just here or here but it is here your whole being everything you are to be able to speak with boldness and other religion what, what is another religion we're facing today besides what she said what she said is one that's very pro, uh, predominant and one of the things she said that when she was talking to it she says because i had asked her i like to use oils um for things. I use them uh, orange oil and lemon oil in my foods. And I like them. I, I actually made um, a concoction to put for mosquitoes because I don't like off and all that stuff. But I like a little bit of the oil and it smells good. So I was asking her about the oils and she says, well, it just depends on how you use the oils, whether it's going to be for incense, whether mm -hmm. it's going to be for all kinds of other things. So uh, we, we, we need to understand that these things are creeping in. Little by little by little in our society, where the young people, the young adults, they're accepting it. The older people are accepting it. And some of you say, well, I never heard of all of that. And that has nothing to do with us. It will have to do with your children. Yes. It's Mark okay. it down. It's going to have to do with your children because they know. And those of you, like Brother Carlos, he has his hands raised. I know where, I know where he's going because he works on campus. He works with those young people. He knows what's in their head and what they're being taught. And these are the things that we have to be ready for. Are we bold enough to stand? That's the question. The question. Brother Carlos, it's your turn to speak tonight. Religion is uh, Darwinian evolution. Is it me or you're very low? Hearing. We can hardly hear you, brother. You're going to have to put your volume up. Darwinian evolution. Okay. It, uh, it's it's the theory that it, we, and all, along with all living things, were derived from nothing. Right. We came from just an explosion in the in, in space, and everything just came together in a series of billions and billions of nat just natural processes. It just happened totally by chance. And all living things just evolved without the help or the intelligence of any supreme being. It just happened. God is nowhere in this picture. And uh, that is the, today's real big religion. And um, I, just like the disciple, disciples in chapter three mm -hmm. showed Israelites 
and the people there, the Pharisees, and, and even the lame man. I'm sure the lame man learned a lot there as well of who the, the, the prince of life is and his power and his plan. And I think that if we, to reach just, just like they reached them with the power of, of the Lord Jesus, I think today we need to show the folks, the children from when they're tiny, more than just Bible stories, but show them how the Bible proves itself scientifically and that you can do that there's so much material it's wonderful oh, yeah it's just handy and, just on the platter today and, and and i'm just going to say put throw this out there we have teachers here please make sunday part of your sunday school a discussion of how the bible is a document a document it's the text it's we can put, build our lives on it because bible stories can be questioned and the truth is not afraid of questions but here's the thing. There's a natural world and there's a supernatural world. And both of them exist simultaneously in this world from him, from day one. But they just think that it's only the natural world. Exactly. So we got to open up their understanding. There is a, a world that you can't see. And it starts with the almighty God. And, 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 and the scriptures can be proven. They can be the, all of these questions that people have, questions that you have that people have had in church. They can all be investigated, looked at, asked about. We should never be afraid of questions. Exactly. So I think I, we must never tell people, don't ask questions because you all knowledge is the answer to questions. I, I can give you a lot. I could cite you a lot of people that they say, no, no, don't ask those questions. No, you have to. Dan because Brown, it, it the continues guy, on in their mind. We don't, we don't have have to. To. All these kids here. There's questions. You might not have the answer, the scientific answer. I don't have all the scientific answer. I don't. I don't even. I just don't know a few. But that's only because I read them. I, you know what I'm saying. And we can become. And there's a great book. I have a great book. I'm going to share it with you. Uh, Sister Kayla, Sister Rodas, uh, uh, Sister. You know these books, little gems. This is used in, in, in um, what's that beautiful place? Micronesia. That area. The beautiful beautiful Tahiti this area it's used the school system uses it and it's about creationism and how God created the world and the proof the scientific proof and that has, that has been the one, young people. that has been the one teaching that started all this mess Atheism. that we are in it, we're in today okay sister Kayla has her hand raised here um brother Charlie touched upon something that we're actually currently doing brother Charlie so I invite you if you want to to look at our YouTube classes because we're actually doing step-by-step -step on it. And Brother Wilmer and Sister Laura here can attest to that, um, our monthly. And that's what I keep asking the congregation to pray about is what we're actually having to do is go step-by-step -step in what uh, creation, divine intelligence is versus evolution, which is one of the big things prominent. It's done full circle. Something we dealt with many, many, many years ago but has come with a vengeance mm -hmm. in many shapes and forms. Um, there's modern, there's something called um, my, macro evolution and micro evolution. The difference between the two it is very detailed. And, you know, we, we have to get our nose in the books and, and actually get the material that, yes, like Sister Girl said, it's handed to a platter, but you have to get it from the right source and understand and then teach them, yes, from the, when they're little, absolutely. But when they're already the teenager years and the uh, pre adolescent years are key for that um, because they're becoming indoctrinated. The school system is just flooded with that. The other religion that has come up a lot in, in the last, I would say, decade or so is pantheism, which is the fact that, um, and there's many forms of pantheism, but it basically centers on that we are God in our, in our inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Within ourselves, we are a God. Um, all these things that are being mentioned, and we have to be very careful when we're talking, and, and, and I'm saying this with freedom because I know that you, you know how I speak very clearly. Um, to say yoga in general is not correct, and I have to correct that because it, then it misleads other people and puts guilt on people that are that are actually on this class that um, yoga in itself, not the practice of where it comes from, but yoga in the stretching part is extremely good for your body, but it's what is attached to it that you have to be very careful with it. And there's many classes you can take for stretching and yoga in the raw sense of it that don't have nothing to do with, you know, making your mind blink and opening it up to all these weird, exactly. you know, things that are oriental. When we say that, we have to always be very clear because we're living in a society where everything is being picked apart. Um, even incense, like incense is a smell that, you know, it's a stick that you can buy. I hate it because I hate the smell. I remember when I first got married, I used to do it after I cooked patanito maduro and get the smell out of the house. I hate it. Like, I just can't stand it. But it's very calming. It's just like lavender and the oils. And 
I 100% agree with Christine that it's how you use something. We can do the same thing about Santeria. You know, you're, and Catholics do it. They light a candle for every saint that exists. But I put candles in my house because of the smell. So it's very important that we all have a clear understanding of how we use these things. But I would say that the most predominant religions that are out there right now attacking the youth is the questioning of God's existence, which comes into line with what Charlie said, divine um, design versus you know, Darwinism, um, evolution of Darwin, and Darwin has so many holes in it that there's other evolution now that's come up, and pantheism, which is what I was explaining, that you're a god within yourself, was something that Oprah Winfrey started um, a long time ago, or it didn't start, but promoted it a lot. I would say those are the two. Yeah, and the reason why we mentioned the yoga was because Christine was a yoga instructor, and she right. backed down out of it because she knew it was coming. What were, The deeper you get into something, the more you Absolutely. see it. And that's why I mentioned the yoga in the sense that because uh, she saw the era and it was actually clashing with the, the spirit that she had within her. She didn't want that. Okay, uh, Christine, you have your hand up and then we'll get tidy up our lesson and finish it off. <laughs> I have a 16 year old and a 15 year old. And right now what's a religion to them is the LGBTQ movement. Okay. Marisa, you're shaking your hand. Um, all those uh, LBG, whatever. My, would you explain that? So explain it, to the class what that would be. That would be the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, um, queer. Um, the argument of being biologically born male but feeling as a female. Mm -hmm. Um, and vice versa. Um, basically, the pride movement. So th th this is another battle that parents have to face. Okay, Marisa, you want to come in on that one? Well, it's crept in. It, it, it's crept in very subtly, but now it's being pushed and shoved. Um, in our faces and basically like she said it's people the way it's cre crept in is that it they can't help the way they were born it's a sickness and we have to help them and accept them and I love discussing this Kayla and I have very heated discussions um, not bad way but we like to talk about these things within our family because we have young people and she deals with young people and it's something that's being pushed in their faces like they have no control over how they are when we know living cases of people that have been saved and their lives have changed like God has the power to do that and just because somebody may have a mannerism doesn't mean they're gay there's people that are more feminine than others and women that are more manly than others. It doesn't mean they're gay or bisexual or whatever. But this movement is being forced upon the church. It's being forced upon us in colleges, in, in the commercials, on books, on products that we buy. They're like subliminal messages being thrown in there. And our youth has been sucked into this, that this is, we're being intolerant. That's the word they love to use. We're not tolerant right. and we love everyone, but we That's won't right. tolerate the sin. And we cannot blindly close the Bible and close the scripture that says that homosexuality is a sin. I mean, what are we gonna do with that scripture? Uh, we can't throw it away, but you know, it's something that the youth right now is facing because they're, they think that it's intolerant and that it's, it's a condition they have that they can't help is how it's crept in. But now it's being forced upon us to think that we are intolerant people and you have to accept it, period. Mm -hmm. Okay, all this brings us down and our time has run out for the class today, but this all comes down to this, is that John and Peter stood with boldness against the religions of their day. Now, what are God's people gonna do today? We're going to have to stand, yes, Dealing with young people, young, young, young adults, they become very heated in what they believe. But the foundation here is we're going to have to stand firm on what we believe. And what we know is Bible, what we know is truth, what we know is maybe we can't explain everything that they're saying and come back at it because we don't have, as Brother Carlos said, we don't have the knowledge and all of that. But if we keep the right attitude, the right spirit, 
and pray that God would break their minds down and break that spirit of unbelief. Because a lot of this believes is just so that they can feel like they can be free to do what they want to do. Hedonism is, he, is another one. Hedonism. Hedonism. Yeah, I know. Because I can do exactly what I want to do and live like I want to do. And, and this is not sin because you call it sin. But if we live in a way that we cannot be reproached by what we believe and what we stand, then we can lay a foundation to win them. And I go back to what I said. I believe fully in the Holy Spirit. What I can't do with my mouth or through my actions, God's spirit can deal with them. I've been praying for some young people for God to just, uh, just break their minds so that, that his spirit can just deal with them in a heavy, heavy way. And because you can talk and talk and talk and talk, but your talk is not going to do the work. It's got to be the Holy Spirit. That's right. Yeah. And we have to continue as God's, I'm looking at all of you, some of your grandparents, some of your students, some of you are teachers, some of you are uh, with children, like uh, Christine said, young children. You have a responsibility like Paul, like P I keep calling him Paul, Peter and John, you're going to have to stand firm with what you believe and not be wishy-washy. And a lot of you are going to have to get a stack of books out and start learning. I hate to tell you, Brother Wilmer and Sister Laura, what's ahead for y'all to learn and to know. You're going to feel like you're back in school for the next 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's not easy, but it can be done. And we can win them because God's spirit, I, I believe fully that he can deal in such a way that people become miserable in their sins and they don't even want to admit their sins. It's just because it was what I want to do. But they can feel so lost. I, I just believe that. And that's, I feel like, part of our responsibility. And to hold up the torch like Peter and John went to pray, but on their way, they healed the man. And he went jumping and leaping and praising God. And out of that gave them the opportunity to spread the gospel and preach it to the unbelievers. So I know that there's a lot more comments we can say and a lot more things to deal with in this class because um, there are many things out there facing us. Not only, not, not, not even laying aside, uh, the fact of all the isms that that are being preached, there is a is a, is a a people that believe in God. They oh yeah, I believe in God, but they 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 don't really serve God. They don't really serve Jesus. They can't really say I've had an experience of being forgiven of my sins. I feel that joy and satisfaction in me. So it's not just the as we could say the heathens. It's those they profess too. Yet they don't have that joy, that excitement about the word of God. I'm not telling you you have to be excited to come to Sunday school class, but I am telling you that you do need to get excited about the word of God every once in a while. Reading it, seeing mm -hmm. things in it, uh, hearing it preached. All these things are necessary for us as God's people. So let us dismiss and then we can talk if we want to talk afterward. Um, uh, Sister uh, Erica. Are y'all cold? You're all covered up with blankies. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm always cold. It, it, it's the way I can enjoy the class, being cozy. <laughs> <laughs> Could you lead us in prayer to dismiss, sister? I'm missing my evening coffee. No, anyway. Yes, I'll pray. Thank you.